and by America. It's time for real television as MMM Carpets brings you movies till the sun comes up. Thing. Welcome to Movies Till Dawn, a new podcast that's a safe space for filmmakers to talk about the fascinating and exasperating, and always unusual and never quite the same thing twice process of creating motion pictures. I'm Raymond DeFolita, and I'm the show's Toastmaster General. And so we come to John Huston, uh, the great and mysterious John Huston. What do we really know about John Huston? Uh, everyone had a very different impression of him. Some thought he was a, a poet and a genius. Some people thought he was kind of nuts and kind of full of shit. Uh, Orson Welles had very different different feelings about him, I think, depending on what day you asked him. Uh, you know, the, the, he, he, Houston provoked controversy and a lot of admiration, and, and there was much to admire and there was much that was controversial about him. Uh, you know... I, I feel, though, that, that he's one of those characters, those larger-than-life figures that if you can honestly say that you have a John Houston story, that, that you experienced firsthand Houston and something happened between you and Houston, you're, you're part of a very special club. Uh, you're, you're, you're a member of a vanishing breed, an ever-thinning breed of people who can say that. Oh, I have a John Houston story. Now, he worked until up right up until his death in 1987, and he worked with actors and technicians who were younger than him by quite a bit. So there are people walking around who can say that. But like I said, it's an, it's an ever-thinning crowd. And I'm one of them. I'm one of that, 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 that crowd that's gradually disappearing who can honestly say, I have a John Huston story. And uh, my John Huston story, the, the headline here, the, the simple version is that John Huston bought me my first drink. And that was, uh, it, it was in 1981, and I was underage. I was uh, just about to turn 17 when John Huston bought me my first drink. Uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you the circumstances, uh, but I'm not going to tell you now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you listen to, to, to this episode because, uh, you know, it, it's John Huston. He's fascinating, but it's very possible that my tale of my first drink being bought by John Huston is even more interesting. But for those of you who, you know, would like to know more about Huston, let me give you the short version. He was a screenwriter in the 30s. He was the son of the great actor Walter Huston, and he was part of a trio of filmmakers who made a very important contribution to uh, – Autourism uh, is really the best way to, to describe it. In, in, you know, in, the, in the silent era, there were American filmmakers who were auteurs. There was Buster Keaton, there was Charlie Chaplin. Uh, but once talkies came about, uh, filmmaking got very regimented, and studios wanted control over everything, and the person who controlled movies was the producer. And the writer didn't meet the director. The director and the producer, he, the director answered directly to the producer. Really, the producer was more in charge than the director. Uh, and all this changed in the late 30s, though, because um, for the first time, a few very successful writers said they wanted to direct their own scripts. The first of them was Preston Sturges, who uh, at Paramount had, had been quite successful and offered to direct his own script for free. And so they gave him a shot, hoping he'd fall on his ass, and he made a movie called The Great McGinty, which won him an Oscar. And that launched uh, Sturge's remarkable and remarkably short career, unfortunately, uh, as a writer-director and, and, a, and a true auteur. His stamp is on every frame of his films. Billy Wilder was another one, uh, after at, also at Paramount, working for a number of years with Charles Brackett as his co-writer. Uh, he convinced Paramount to give him a shot at directing one of his own scripts, and it was called The Major and the Minor. Uh, with Ginger Rogers, and naturally, we know what happened. Billy Wilder became Billy Wilder. The the third member of that trio, though, was John Huston. And after uh, as many years during the 30s as a screenwriter at Warner Brothers, uh, he got his chance to direct his script, I think, for free again to prove to Jack Warner that he could do it, and it was The Maltese Falcon and uh, with Humphrey Bogart. And, you know, he became John Huston. 
Uh, and of those three, he was the only one who did not remain only a writer-director. In fact, he started to write less and less. Fewer of his films were his scripts over the years. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the the best of them were, and I believe he polished most of what he did himself, too. Uh, I think the reason for that was possibly his lifestyle. Um, Houston was a kind of grand adventurer. He he had a, lived a very flamboyant and profligate uh, and and even somewhat lurid life, and uh, you know there were there was gambling and there were marriages and mistresses and children and uh, horse racing and paintings and castles in Ireland and chandeliers and uh, you know all kinds of stuff that that Houston had to maintain, uh, and so he worked a lot, basically a, a picture a year for for pretty much all of his the rest of his life, and as I said, he worked up to the very end. His last movie was The Dead, uh, adapted from the James Joyce novel. So that was John Huston in a nutshell. And, uh, and, and, and I am going to play you, before I tell you about how he bought me my first drink when I was underage, I'm going to play you an interview that I did with John Huston. Now, it's it was done under unusual circumstances uh, as, as Huston died in 1987, uh, and this was done relatively recently. It was done via a spiritual medium, uh, a, a fellow I met in, in L.A., uh, based, in, based in Hollywood, behind Musso and Frank's uh, bar and grill, actually, the apartment building adjacent to the parking lot there. He lives in that. And he's an interesting guy. Like I said, he's, he does showbiz uh, uh, medium stuff. He, he reunited Dean and Jerry. He... You know, he's gotten the Marx Brothers together, apparently. I wasn't there for either of these things. But, but he, he, he met me and he said, I think I can channel John Houston for you. Uh, so we, we recorded it in Brett Ratner's basement, which is a discotheque. In fact, we recorded uh, Peter Bogdanovich's interview there that's also on this podcast, which you can find. Uh, and, and it worked. John Houston came down for... 28 minutes, and uh, now right before we did the interview, uh, this guy, the, the medium, said to me, you need to do this with an English accent. And I said, why? And he said, trust me, he's going to be a lot more responsive and more comfortable if he thinks you're English. Uh, and I can do a pretty good English accent. So I said, well, why not? Let's give it a shot. And so what you're going to hear is it's me speaking with an English accent interviewing John Houston, uh, and then uh, you know, if you make it through that, you get to hear how Houston bought me my first drink back when he was alive in 1981. Mr. Houston, at one time or another in your younger days, I think you were a, a, a painter, a boxer, a, a Mexican cavalry officer, and a journalist. And I think you were 35 before you first directed a film. Now, tell me how you did go into films and why. Well, I was a writer. Um, the, um, the lot of the writer in Hollywood at that time was rather dismal. And um, one would write what one thought were, were good pictures, and, and uh, they would be changed when they got to the screen and become bad pictures. Um, and so my last my last uh, contract with a major studio, I stipulated that uh, uh, I was to become a director at the end of that contract. Otherwise, they would lose their option on my services. And, um, um, and that's how it happened. Which studio was that? That was Warner Brothers. And this was the business of being a boxer and a painter and all the rest of it. These was fair time occupations. Well, that was long past. Yes. Yes. Now, why do you want to make films? Um, I'm, I'm fascinated in the first place by the, by the medium of films itself. Um, if you'd care to have me go into this, I, I shall. I'd like you to. Um, it seems to me that films are closer to the thought process than uh, than even writing, than even letters. Um, the, the succession of pictures 
is flows uh, in a well-made film almost as one's own thoughts flows. I've often thought that it was as though the, the camera was behind one's eyes and, and uh, uh, one's own eyes projected onto the screen what one wished to see. This, of course, is in inspirational moments. Well, it follows, then, that it's of extreme importance what you're trying to express in films. Now, have you got a particular message that you've tried to get across consistently? Uh, no conscious message. Uh, I only make films that interest me, uh, and in, in the hopes that they will interest other people, other people being like me, or my being like others. You have, in fact, the artist's conviction that what interests you will probably interest other people. That's my hope. Yeah. Now, on the whole, in your film career, let's take America first, in your Hollywood career, have you been able to make the sort of pictures that you want to make or not? Always. Always. I've, I've also made the sort of pictures I didn't want to make, but that was no fault of the, of the studios, that was my own fault. You've never been bullied or pressed by a studio into doing something you didn't want to do? Quite the contrary. Well, now, what about the... We're both too sophisticated to pretend that there isn't a war between the commercial and the good in filmmaking. What are your experiences in that war? Well, um, that war, if one chooses to describe it as a war, is, um, uh, is, pretty, is pretty well founded. In the first place, it costs uh, millions of dollars for the, for the picture maker's palette. Uh, cadmium yellow costs a hundred thousand pounds. Uh, carmine vermilion costs two hundred thousand. Uh, um, when one makes a picture, one's spending with every brush stroke hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so, as there is a vested interest in the picture, <laughs> It's, uh, it's required on the part of the, of the director, the, of the picture maker, that, that at least that investment be returned. Yes, but now doesn't it then follow from that that it's absolutely impossible to make a picture which will not be a commercial success? <sighs> impossible, I mean, with the approval of the studio. Uh, it follows often that the pictures are not a commercial success, too. Um, um, I've, I've had I've had I've had studios uh, back me up in in enterprises where they had grave doubts and they were right in their doubts, but nevertheless they went through with it. Well, now let's take the example which most of your public will call quickly to mind: the Red Badge of Courage. Yes, uh, many of us would say one of the great films, but clearly not a commercial success. Now tell us what happened in your relations between yourself and the studio. Well, I wanted to make that film and they didn't want me to make it, and. Um, I uh, brought pressure, only psychological pressure. I, I, uh, I persisted in, in uh, I pursued it and, and asked them again to let me make it, and a third and a fourth time. And, uh, and finally, they agreed, and much against their wills. Um, and I made it, and um, I made it to my satisfaction. And, um, and um, I shall never forget the first night, uh, the, uh, rather the preview, what they call a sneak. I shall never forget the people rising, the, the audience rising and walking out of the theater. I swear they'd have fought their way to get out. They didn't like it. They liked no part of it. And um, um, I, could, I could go into their reasons, I mean, what I assumed to be their reasons, I've thought about it a good deal in the intervening years. Um, but the fact remains that the audience didn't like it. Um, now, there was a great deal given to what the studio did in the way of butchering the film afterwards. Uh, I had to go to Africa to make another film immediately afterwards. And um, so I, I, I wasn't there for the, for the final embellishments on the film. And, and I heard the drastic and dreadful things that occurred. And when I saw the film some, oh, a year or so later, uh, they hadn't. I was rather uh, pleasantly surprised. Uh, 
the film was, I don't think, quite as good as, as it was when I'd left it, but was, it was uh, not, not bad. Did you, in fact, take no interest in this when you were in Africa? I was on another film. That's and one can only do one film at a time. Nonetheless, mm. this was what perhaps you thought was going to be your masterpiece and you knew this was going on and it has been criticised against you that you took no interest in it after you'd finished shooting. Is that true or not? Well, uh, you can only do one at a time. And, uh, and one's uh, uh, schedule in, in making films, uh, you, you move from one to the next and you can't very well be thinking about a film has been completed in, in Africa when you're shooting another film in the Belgian Congo, in the heart of the, in the dark heart of Africa. Do you think that particular company would let you make, uh, again, a film which they weren't satisfied with box office? I'd, uh, you're, you're addressing that uh, question to the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get back then to the key question, is it really possible, more than once in a way, just as an exception, to make a film in Hollywood which isn't box office? Um, yes, it's possible to do it more than once in a way because I've done it twice and three times in a way. Um, the, the, uh, the major studios have been very indulgent towards me and I have, I have no, no complaint against them whatever. Um, I, I particularly feel the responsibility in making a film, uh, to try and make it box office italics um, because not only I mean it's going to be a little harder the next time a little harder the time after that and it's only due to their to the to the indulgence of the uh, of, of the uh, the men that furnish the money uh, how long how long that can go on how long you can continue to make unsuccessful films but it not only affects oneself it also affects the the, the um, work and, and careers of um, I should the work of of others. If if you if you make a film, if I make a film that uh, uh, has any has any um, uh, the, the, in which there's any element of discovery, and that film is a failure, they're going to be a little tougher on the on the next man who tries to do something new. One critic said of you once, perhaps a bit unkindly, that you were always prepared to be an artist with other people's money, but when you were in production yourself, you were strictly box office. Now, is that unfair? Uh, I think it is. I think it is. Your own productions have, in fact, uh, been very different in type from some of these art jobs that you've done for the big studios. Uh, well, the, 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 the art, let me say this, uh, the, probably the art jobs that I've done for the studios have in the long run made more money than some of my own immediately successful films. And some of my own, uh, some of my own films have, have not fared well at all. Well, now, when we started talking... I no, there's been no distinction there no, no. Between, my own, between work for my own company and work for other companies. When we started talking, I asked you if you had any consistent message that you tried to put across, and you said no. But you obviously have views. Some of your films have a clear social content, and you probably have political views as well. Now, have you ever been subjected to any kind of, of uh, censorship, even hidden censorship, in the kind of social content that you've put into a film? Uh, none that weren't directly connected with the, with the Breen office. Um, and that's, that's moral rather than political. And that's outside the control of the company, of course. Outside. Well, now, what about a film that you once made, which I'm interested in, which was called Let There Be Light, and which was about shell shock cases, I think, in the last war. Now, is it true that that film was censored after you'd made it or not? Well, I made that film for the, for the army, for the American army. I was in the army, a uh, soldier at the time, and it was the, the last film, I, last work I did for the army before... Um, going out of uniform. Um, no, it was not censored. It was simply not shown. The, um, I think the, um, the main reason was um, their reluctance to invade the, the privacy of, um, of these men who were neurotics and who after the making of the film, or as a matter of fact, during the making of the film, were recovered. Uh, um, 
at least to their to their former um, former state of emotional composure. <laughs> um, that and it's no it's no great advertisement for war to see what um, what the experience of combat does to to men's souls. Well, but surely mm. if you say that a film is not shown because it's no great advertisement for war, that is a form of censorship. And there was there was an attempt at that time to to get enlistments into the army. So in other words, there was some connection between public policy and the not showing of this film. Yes, I think I think it was uh, uh, equally there was there was one group that that uh, preferred the film not be seen, another that it uh, uh, who acted quite uh, um, uh, quite objectively uh, regarding the men themselves who were, who were photographed. Would you say that a connection between public policy and the not showing of, of, of a film contains at least some element of censorship? Um, well, in censorship, I think rather of revising or, or um, omitting parts of, parts of the film rather than just not showing it. It's still secret, it's shown to doctors. Uh, as a matter of fact, the War Department very generously gave me a print of the picture the other day. Uh, do you, Mr. Houston, have any political commitment of your own? Is there a political message you would like to get across in films if you had the chance? None. None. Are you interested in the, in the affairs of the world, or do you live entirely in films? Um, well, I think, I think uh, films live in the world, and one can't, um, one can't separate one's work from what's going on around one. Um, yes, of course, I'm vitally interested, Mike. Is it true that you once projected making an international film, perhaps under the auspices of the United Nations? I'd hoped to bring that about. Why didn't it come off? Um, I think the, the real reason, when, when the project was, was first conceived, uh, there was a great deal more harmony between nations, they weren't. We weren't divided. Um, our, the the allies uh, stood as one against a common enemy. Well, now there's been a redivision, a reassortment, and and um, 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 the hope was then to create a better understanding bet between countries, uh, and in and in that way further the peaceful aims of the, of the world. Um, I'm afraid it's a little bit too late for that now. What was the film you wanted to make? What did you want to do with this film? Well, it wasn't one film, but a series of films. I had hoped to, to um, uh, bring about a, a whole enterprise where a Frenchman could go to the United States and make a film under the auspices of the United Nations or uh, um, a filmmaker from Thailand, <laughs> where anybody could go under diplomatic immunity and, and make a film that would be acceptable to the United Nations, not sugar-coated, but honest and straightforward, and, and in this way convey uh, the idea of one country to the audience of another. Would you still like the chance to do that? I'd very much, yeah. very much. Now, turning for a moment to your more commercially successful films, I have noticed in them, as I expect many of our viewers have, that there is consistently an element of toughness, violence in them very often, and one wonders whether you haven't a preoccupation with that. Is this true or not? I have no idea. Uh, you yourself have rather boasted some, or well, perhaps boasted is unfair, but you've rejoiced in living a rather violent life yourself. Well, I've never thought of it in terms of violence, but um, I've been interested and mildly amused on most occasions. <laughs> you've been prepared to put your fists up and fight at any rate? Like all of us. Uh, it's true, isn't it, that you were in fact a boxing champion when you were a boy? An amateur Amateur champion, champion yes. Uh, how many times have you fought, fought a man since you were adult? Oh, not very often. Is it true that you once fought Errol Flynn, or is that a newspaper story? No, that's a fact. That's a fact. How did it come about? Well, my very good friend and I 
we weren't friends then. There's no better way to get friends with a man than to have a fight with him. <laughs> um, we're, at a, we're at a party. <clears throat> and um, I stopped to have a drink with Errol. And Errol said something rather objectionable about a friend of mine. And, and um, I think I called him a dirty name for that. Or said it was untrue. And that even if it was, why he was a dirty name for repeating it. And um, Errol said, do you want to make anything out of it? This is total recall. <laughs> and um, I said, yes. So we went down to the bottom of the garden. And um, the party went on. Um, and we fought. We had a long, excellent, very, very good fight it was. Fought for the better part of an hour. And um, then the fight then was discovered. The fight was going on. We were, it came out, and we were separated and went to the hospital our various ways. Both of you went to yes, hospital? Yes, yes. I can see why you may respect one another since. Well, now, leaving, uh, I won't press you on this point of violence, but it probably is true, isn't it, that as a film director, you have been more spectacularly successful with men than with women uh, actors. I mean, one thinks of Bogart, for instance, uh, Audie Murphy, Joseph Ferrer, and all these people. Is it, it, do you have a feeling that you can direct men better than women? Uh, I don't think so. I think some of, some of the best films I've made have, um, have had fine women's performances in them. Um, Catherine Hepburn in The African Queen and your own Deborah Carr in a film that I did. Um, Mr. Allison. Um, I think that probably my... I like stories um, that have to do with men more than stories that have to do with women. Um, um, there, there are very few love stories um, that, aren't, that aren't inclined, or don't tend to become saccharine. And uh, I, I think this is the reason that I've, I've worked, uh, I've done pictures that, with all male casts. Uh, any special understanding with Bogart? It seemed to, to me, for instance, that you always did direct him with startling success. Well, that was, uh, there, was there was never a, a, a plan, uh, so far as uh, Bogie and I were concerned. It's just that uh, pictures that I was interested in, Bogie seemed to fit into. Well, now, one critic said of you, looking over all these, uh, what I may call commercial films of yours, that there was a continuing theme and that it was the pursuit of ambition which is always thwarted at the moment of fulfilment. Uh, is this true? Do you recognize that at all? Well, it's been pointed out to me. But you, but it, it, you it didn't... It was not make, conscious it's not conscious, no. 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 Is there any parallel for that in your own life? I mean, for instance, has ambition turned sour on you at any stage? Um... Yes, it, it has. Uh, ambition has turned sour on me, uh, I think, probably five days out of the week. Um, but um, um, I'd have to, I'd have to be, uh, uh, I'd have to analyze myself or more, be more deeply analyzed than I am to, to give you the correct answer to that, to that question. Well, let me then ask mm. you another question. Do you honestly feel, give me a candid answer, mm. do you honestly feel, looking back at the age of... Uh, 54 or whatever you are, that you have succeeded in life so far or not? I've given no thought to that. None whatever. Um, I'm only interested in what I'm doing at the time I'm doing it. I'm talking about filmmaking now, of course. Um, when I first, before I made my first film, a very dear friend of mine who was a great filmmaker, a man named Henry Blanky, whom you've probably never heard, said to me, John, be sure that each scene, as you make it, is the best scene in the picture. And this I've tried to observe. Well, now, I want to, to take you back a little further in your life, even than filmmaking, and see if we can throw some light on you. Uh, go right back to your early memories. Your parents, I believe, were divorced when you were six years old. Now, do you remember that? They were divorced a little earlier. Well, I, I suppose about that time. Yes, I do. What, what, what do you remember about it? 
Um, well, part I remember and part I've been told. It's hard to um, to separate. Was it a shock uh, to you? Their 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 divorce. Their no, divorce. I don't know when that happened. No, no, I wasn't aware. You you spent some time with each parent afterwards. <sighs> Equally close with both of them. Um, probably closer to my mother as a child is, but then at a when I when I uh, got to be a, an adolescent, why I went to my father. You spent in childhood, of course, much more time with, with your my mother. mother. Yes. Did she encourage you and uh, and praise you, or was she tough with you on the whole? Um, alternately tough and uh, and indulgent. Did you look forward to visits to your father when you were a small child? Of course. And how old were you when you went and began to spend most of your time with him? About 14, 15. And subsequently, you then developed a very close attachment yes. to him. Uh, is it of interest or is it just a coincidence that he personally appeared in so many of your films? Um... Well, I, I'd, I'd always planned. I was thought I was. Uh, I admired my father's work very much, and quite objectively, um, quite apart from our uh, from our closenesses as, as individuals, um, and and so I planned to um, um, to make films in which I thought my father could shine. Now you admired your father's work very much. Um, he was obviously a very amiable easy-going man, is it possible that he was a shade ineffectual and weak in his personal character or not? Uh, no, no. He was a very strong man, uh, character-wise. Um, I don't... I, I, and, a, and a very moral man. Uh, I don't mean moral in any bigoted or, um, or small sense, but uh, only in the largest sense. I don't think that my father ever, ever committed an unfaithful and untrue act in his life. And he impressed you as a strong character at that time. You never felt the need to look after him, to oh, care no. for him, no. 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 Well, now, you did, I believe, when you were about 12 or 13 years old, have a serious illness, TB, was it, or something of that kind. And there's a story that's told about you, and I want to ask whether it's true or not, that when you were in hospital, you broke out one night and plunged into the river. Now, is that true? Well... Not quite. Well, tell me what happened. When I was when I was about eleven years old, they took me to California, uh, to to Arizona, and um, um, for my health, and um, and I was like all children, um, anxious for that, yearning for that physical freedom that was denied to me, and um, and I didn't have any better sense than at night when when the uh, but everyone was asleep and the house was quiet to slip out. And uh, I used to go swimming in the, in the canals, um, the canals of Phoenix. That's, I think, what, what you're talking about. This is not a single mad attempt to prove something to yourself. It was just fun swimming at night. That's right. Yeah. Um, have you ever been poor? Oh, yes, often. Very poor? Constantly. Have you ever had real, <laughs> real difficulty in making oh, ends? Yes. I don't mean Hollywood poorness, but no. have you ever had real difficulty? Yes. What yes. did you do then? Well, once in London, when I was about 25 years old, um, a whole series of circumstances mounted up to my finally being completely broke and without much hope of, uh, of um, being otherwise. And um, there was no use. I could have called my father for help or friends, but I'm, I'm enough of a believer in the gambler's creed that if you're in... If you're in a bad streak, there's nothing to do about it. You've just got to play it out. And so for six months, um, I slept uh, on the embankment and uh, in, in such um, thresholds and beds as were offered. And at the end of six months, your luck turned. And at the end of the six months, the luck turned. 
Now, you've done in your life, particularly in your younger life, a, a great many different types of job. I mentioned some of them at the beginning. You've lived in different countries, and one of the things that's recorded about you is that you've had, I think, four different marriages. Now, I don't want to ask you in any detail about those, but looking back on your life, do you feel that you have been to blame for this lack of success in marriage or not? Well, I don't think it was lack of success. Uh, three of my marriages were eminently successful. There was only one, <laughs> and she'll know if she hears this program which, which wife I'm referring to. The others were all very successful indeed. Well, now, um, we've got to the end of this program. I hope she is listening to it. We've got to the end of it, and I'm going to put a last question to you. And I've been watching you as we've been talking and thinking that you're a restless character. Uh, perhaps you haven't yet quite found your own real satisfaction in life. And I want you to tell me, if you can, what you really care about. What is it that you're searching for? Is it security? Is it perfection? What do you mind about more than anything else in the world? I suppose I mind about my children more than anything else in the world. Um, who are a projection of me. Uh, I'm trying to make them better than I am, um, which is the hope of every, every father, I'm sure. Um, I look for my future in them. So there you have it, uh, an interview with John Houston uh, that I have to tell you that, that everything I told you about that interview, about me interviewing him and the English accent, uh, it was all a lie. Every, every word of that was a, a dirty, filthy lie. That wasn't me, um, as you may have guessed. That was actually a man named John Freeman. Uh, who interviewed Houston in 1959 for a TV show called Face to Face. And I've probably lost your trust now because I'm sure you believed what I, what I told you, that that was me via medium interviewing John Houston. But I, I, I beg you, give me one more chance because uh, the story I'm about to tell you about John Houston and buying me my first drink when I was 16 years old is absolutely true. So here goes. So it's 1981, early summer, and Columbia Pictures is about to release the movie version of the hit musical Annie, uh, and it was directed by John Huston. And as part of the kind of the uh, the ballyhoo celebration of this new huge hit movie on the way, that uh, didn't turn out to be that big a hit, I don't think. Um, they decided to give John Huston a tribute, and the Directors Guild of America uh, got involved and said, "Why don't we co-sponsor?" A Weekend with John Houston, uh, where we'll get the great man himself to show up and we'll show his movies and he'll talk about them. Uh, and it was decided to hold this event on the Queen Mary, the gorgeous Art Deco ship docked for years in, in Long Beach, California. And my father uh, was a member of the DGA. He knew how much I loved all this stuff and Houston's films and Hollywood history. And he said, would you like to go? And I said, Absolutely. So my mom and dad and I embarked uh, on a journey to Long Beach. And we got there, and sure enough, there was John Houston greeting people and being charming and, and, and being... But now, uh, an odd detail that I remember, um, he, he wore a sweatsuit all the time, and it was sort of orange and yellow, and it was a Lacoste sweatsuit. Now, this would look pretty silly on everyone, and in fact, it kind of did look silly on Houston, but... He carried it off with a grandeur as if this was just sort of a, a weekend that he was going to relax and hang and talk, and he wasn't. there was nothing formal going on here. Uh, there was something very lovely about that, but there was also something, as soon as I met him, I, I realized I, I was meeting uh, a, a character from another world, from another generation, the kind of person they just don't make anymore. Uh, he was hugely charismatic, a little scary. Uh, you definitely saw the, the demonic in, in, behind the charm. Uh, and, uh, but, he, but he was nothing if not, you know, as I said, welcoming and charming. Uh, and so the weekend began. And they would screen movies, and Houston would show up to do Q&As after the movies. 
Only for some reason, uh, on I, on one of the nights, I guess I guess on the second night on Saturday night, they did a screening of I believe it was um, African Queen, and afterwards the the uh, sound system wasn't functioning. The the microphone broke down. Now Houston was ill much of his adult life from smoking, and he had emphysema, and he had an oxygen tank with him, and uh, and he was trying to talk to a big hall of a hundred or more people. But he had no amplification, and he was coughing a lot. He was having trouble breathing, and it was apparent he wasn't really going to be able to go on with this this whole thing. Uh, and he apologized. He said, "I'll never forget what he said." He said, "I'm sorry, but I haven't got the wind for this." The wind. Uh, but then he said uh, that if some of us would like to drop by his suite, he'd be happy to hang out and talk to a smaller group. He said he could only accommodate a smaller group, but, you know, if you want, if we want to drop by, do so. Uh, and so after this this thing disbanded, I said to my dad, let's go. Let's go to John Houston's suite. And my father said, you know, he doesn't really mean that. He, he's being polite. He's being, he's being old school gentlemanly, but he wants to rest. He doesn't really want to entertain people in his suite. And I said, no, no, he said it, you know, let, let, let's take him at his word. So my father said, well, I tell you what, you go. He said, I don't feel like it's a polite thing to do, but, you know, if you want to do it, give it a shot. So they had put him up in the captain's uh, quarters of, of the old ship. Uh, and I went and I knocked on the door. And I went into this lovely suite and there were about seven or eight people sitting around a round table with John Houston. And he was telling stories, and, and it all seemed very, and it was, very intimate and lovely. And there was one seat left, uh, and it was right next to him. So I slinked in, took a seat. He smiled, and the other people smiled. I was the kid in the room. but uh, And we sat around and listened to him tell stories. I think we had just screened his remarkable documentary earlier that day. We had screened Let There Be Light, a, a a movie about the traumatic effects of World War II on soldiers. Um, and that was a, a movie that the U.S. government, they, they didn't see it coming. They let him make it, and they took one look at it, and they, they banned it. They did not want the public to see the aftermath of what happened mentally to, to veterans. Uh, and it, you know, as I said, it's a remarkable film. So we talked quite a bit about that, as I recall. And uh, at some point, a knock on the door, and the steward uh, uh, showed up, and he took the drinks order. He said, would everyone like to order drinks? And said yes. So they started going around the table, and someone ordered some coffee, someone ordered a beer, a soda, and I'll just have a water. Uh, you know, people, did they all did the thing. Now, they got to John Houston, and, and remember, I'm sitting next to him. But they get to him first, and they ask him what he'd like to drink, and he said, vodka tonic. And then I was next, and they said, what would you like? And I heard myself say, vodka tonic. It just popped out. I don't, I, I don't know why. It popped out. I just wanted what he wanted. I wanted to be him, I guess. Nobody said boo, I, you know, no one asked my age, no one did, it. and I'd never had a vodka tonic. I don't think I'd ever had anything. Uh, and so that that's what happened. Uh, the, they brought the drinks, and John Houston toasted everyone, including me, and I, 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 I clinked glasses with him and had my first drink, which I'm pretty sure he paid for, which is why I always say John Houston bought me my first drink. If you enjoyed listening to Movies Till Dawn, you can visit my blog where I post videos related to the subjects that I interview. Just go to moviestilldawn.blogspot.com. You can find this podcast at moviestilldawnpodcast.com, but we're also available on most of your favorite podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, TuneIn, Spotify, and YouTube. I would love to hear from you. If you're inspired to reach out, you can email me at moviestilldawnpodcast at gmail.com. And please feel free to follow me on Twitter at RealRDEF. 
That's R-E-E-L-R-D-E-F. And if you have a film geek in your life, or even just a mildly curious fan, spread the word that we're here. Thank you.